episode seven already of The Behavioural Investor. We've actually got the co-author Ross Bentley of Performance Pilot from episode three. So it's really great to keep plumbing the talent and the knowledge behind that book and to have you on today, Ross. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. This should be fun. First of all, I would like to hear a little bit about your racing career, then your coaching career, including books and, and seminars that you've written and that you run, and also what's an interesting and unexpected way someone has applied what you have taught. I started, uh, my, my father took me to a race when I was five years old. And, uh, you know, as a little kid, you know, you kind of, you know, you think I want to be an astronaut. I want to be a fireman. You know, I mean, I, all these things that you kind of think about as a, as a five-year-old. Well, at that moment in time, I went, I want to be a race car driver. And I never grew up and uh, here I am you know, um, 50, 60 years later, uh, still playing in this sport and doing what I love to do. Uh, I got to drive at pretty much the highest level in, at least in North American uh, motorsport in Indy, Indy cars and, you know, never won the Indy 500, but uh, got to race with some of the, you know, greatest drivers in the world and did that and then raced in professional sports car racing. And along the way, I found that, one of the things that I loved as much as driving race cars is helping other people kind of get the same thrill that I get from, from driving, the same enjoyment, the same passion that I get. So I learned early on that I loved the teaching side of it as much as the doing side of it. And so I started coaching, uh, I guess, first started teaching driving and then instructing driving and then started coaching drivers. And I, and I think that teaching, instructing and coaching are, there are differences there. So uh, the coaching thing has kind of turned into, that's my main focus and has been for quite a while now. And, um, uh, it, it's, it's something that I just get this massive kick out of helping people do things that they never thought they could do and yep. seeing that light bulb, seeing that smile, seeing that confidence build in somebody and, having them experience something that a lot of times they never thought they could. And I've had a chance to work with young drivers, you know, from the age of 12 who have gone on to professional racing and won a lot of major events uh, worldwide. And I've worked with a lot of, um, you know, typically it's the gentleman driver, um, but a, a lot of gentle women drivers these days. And, you know, who, who have been successful in business and other areas in their life and then went, now I want to go and do what I've always wanted to do, which was drive a race car. And fortunately, the sport is, it, it is, it's accessible in that way. You know, if you're a football fan, a tennis fan, I mean, you know, if, if you love tennis, you can't get at center court at Wimbledon and play a match. And yet in, in motorsport, you know, if you're 45 years old or 65 or 15, you can go and get a race car and you can go and learn to race and you can go and race at, you know, any major uh, circuit in the world. So it's a, it's, 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 it's very cool that way. And I love doing that part of it. And uh, there's, glam there's a lot of glamour in it. It's, yeah, it's something we'd all love to do. I know I'd love to drive some sort of fast car around the track. I've watched it a lot, but yeah. <laughs> it, it's interesting. I've had a lot of people, you know, it's the typical, you're on an airplane, somebody sitting next to you and they go, what do you do? And I, I actually hate that question because I, where it can get into, but, uh, uh, you know, if I say racing and, and it, a lot of people go, oh, I've always wanted to do that. And, 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 and while there's a side of me that like, let me help you. There's also a side of me that goes, actually, you haven't wanted to, at least not bad enough. Otherwise you would, because it is accessible. Uh, mm -hmm. not, you know, not a knock against anybody who hasn't done it yet. But I, the key word there, I think, is yet. So give it a shot. It's, it's, it is accessible and it is uh, more challenging. Uh, if, if I could just take a, like a, a quick second to tell you this very quick story of a gentleman driver, very successful driver uh, in his early 20s, he played on the PGA Tour, the Professional Golfers Association Tour, made the cut in every tournament for three years, never won a major tournament or whatever, never won a tournament. But how good a golfer do you need to be to make the cut in every PGA tournament for three years? Really, really good. He left that 
became a US Navy SEAL, you know, one of the toughest things you can do, right? Retired from military, went into a business, and I won't mention the name, but uh, went into and created a brand um, of alcohol that everybody would, would know the name of. Um, then took over yeah. another company who was that was doing about 25 million a year in sales. In over 11 years, took that company and grew it to over a billion in sales. And then at 45, 46 years old, he decided he wanted to go racing. And I started mm -hmm. coaching him. And about three years in, he said, you know, this is the toughest thing that I've ever done in my life. We've also heard that investing is also pretty hard. And the whole point of this podcast is the behavioral challenge that it poses. When I was having a browse around on Speed Secrets, your website, I saw that you dedicate some of your training to the mental side of, of driving. But one of the toughest sports out there, uh, it's good to have you on to tutor us a bit. Maybe we can't go to the track, but I'll... <laughs> yeah, I, I can see you've got a track behind you on the whiteboard. Maybe we get some... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Get you on the whiteboard at some point. Can I just ask a quick question? You mentioned there's a difference between teaching, instructing, and coaching. Can you summarize the differences between those three? To me, teaching is putting information into somebody. Uh, instructing is kind of the putting some in, demonstrating, that kind of thing. Coaching is drawing out what the person knows. And that's the simple kind of way of looking at it. And, and obviously, you know, one is no better than the other, but there's a time and a place for each. And you know, I think, um, you know, you kind of asked the question, uh, well, but, you know, kind of what people have taken away from my, what I do. And a, a lot of people who have been very successful in business have gone through maybe a seminar that I've done on sort of the mental game of driving. And one of the things that they've, they've taken away is the idea that this coaching approach, um, Coaching in a way is no different than managing people in a business. It's, it's all about bringing out the best in people. And, you know, if somebody doesn't have some basic knowledge, you have to give them that basic knowledge. But if somebody's got some basic knowledge, the worst thing you can do, I think, at that moment in time is tell them more. Like at that point, it's draw it out of them. Because if you draw it out of them, then it becomes theirs. They own it. And that's when magic really starts to happen it's it's ultimately it's all about just bringing out the best performance in people i'm glad there is some chance then that we can transfer some of the skills that you have uh to to the challenge of investing so hopefully great. yeah <laughs> well if we can do it with a pilot we can do it with a, a race race car instructor surely <laughs> yeah okay so our next question then uh ross given this is an investing podcast in just a minute, uh, what was the last investment that you made or decided not to make and why? So I, I, I would say that I'm, uh, I'm not a wild investor. I, investment wise, it's more, it's real estate. And the last was uh, the decision my wife and I made to purchase a house in Hawaii. And in a way it was a little bit, um, you know, we'd been talking about it for a while and we were on vacation and we kind of just, you know, we were doing a little looking around and we stumbled across this place. And it was one of those things where I think everything just lined up, you know, the house, we kind of went, this would be the perfect place. Uh, and the, my wife is, my wife, um, she dances hula, she sings and she speaks uh, Hawaiian. So she's really into the Hawaiian culture. So as we walked into the house, there is a Hawaiian tradition where you do this little chant to ask permission to enter the home. And she did that. And when the owner of the home found out that she did that, he went, these are the people that should have this. And just prior to leaving to go to Hawaii, I had met a mortgage broker and who kind of said, you know, anytime you need any help, let me know. And it was kind of this, uh, I guess, a lot of different things coming together. And there was, a, you know, there was sort of that gut feel that this just felt right. But all the logical part of it, I think, kind of came together as well in, in that 
this mortgage broker could get us the best deal. Uh, the fellow that was selling it went, you guys are the right people. And yeah. fortunately gave us, <laughs> gave us an amazing deal. And it was just like, okay, it feels good. Logically, it's the right thing. We did it. And, you know, we ended up selling it a few years later and, you know, uh, that wasn't sort of the goal wasn't to flip it or anything like that, but the timing was right again and just everything again kind of lined up the right way and we go, now's the right time to sell this and that helps us with something else we want to do in our next move here. And, mm. and um, so that was kind of the investment and then the um, selling of that investment that has led to us being able to do one other purchase something else another another home mm, sure there's some elements of, of serendipity but there's also a, a, a behavioral aspect almost literally your wife did a dance and that just <laughs> made me think about the contrast with your average degenerate trader sitting at a computer at 11 o'clock at night stressing about a company they barely know it'd be nice to have that kind of a story behind your trades i think well and i always wonder about people that invest um, uh, without having any kind of connection. You know, it's, it's, it's pure numbers. And while there's a logical part of that, you know, I think maybe the behavioral part of it and, and that, you know, in this case, there was a little bit of, I don't want to sound too woo woo kind of out there kind of thing, but there was a spiritual connection with my wife in this home. And you kind of went, okay, that helped us make that decision. I don't think, Without that, we would have made the decision. We also wouldn't have made the decision strictly on that, but some of the other things, the financial side of things lined up. So mm. um, I, I think that connection part of it, for me, uh, in anything that I've invested in, I needed to feel connected to it, whether it was just that's a company that I believe in or I don't believe in, something like that. It also relates to the topic of looking under different rocks and looking at different investment opportunities. If you are a value investor per se, if you're going to follow the rules that everyone else follows, then you're only ever going to get the same result and you're essentially just competing with the same tools. So unless you're going to look under different rocks and use potentially a different methodology, um, you're not going to come up with something unique. Well, that's interesting you say that because that's a conversation that I have in, within racing a lot in that uh, drivers, race teams, sometimes they'll go, oh, look at what that team or that driver is doing. I'm going to go and copy them. And, you know, this year in Formula One, there is a team that essentially, Racing Point, essentially copied last year's Mercedes Formula One car, and they've become more competitive this year by doing that. But it's kind of like, well, the best you could ever do, though, is second. You know, you're never going to get into the lead doing that. You've got to, you know, maybe that's a good step along the way. But I think you're right. I mean, if you just copy what everybody else does, the best you're going to do is maybe tie them. But yeah. more likely, you're going to be second because they've already moved on. One of, one of the things that, as you know, the name of our podcast is Behavioral Investors. and Warren Buffett, who's the famous investor, once said that it's not about your level of IQ in investing or your intelligence. It's about your ability to control your behaviors and your urges when investing. So how does that play out in the car and racing um, field? Yeah, uh, that's a topic that... Uh, I actually work with drivers and coach them on their behavioral traits and their ability to adapt to different situations. And, you know, if you look at the greatest race drivers of all times and you kind of say, what are their behavioral traits? What are their personality traits? You know, are they very aggressive? Or are they more kind of laid back a little bit? Are they patient? Are they impatient? Are they, you know, um, uh, very kind of a logical kind of a person or are they more just a gut feel kind of person and the champions that win most often you almost can't identify what they are because they have the ability to adapt and i say you know they're they're like a chameleon 
that when it's time to be patient, be patient. When it's time to be impatient, be impatient. Drivers who don't win as often tend to be stuck in one way and they tend to be, they tend to behave in one way. And, you know, they're either always impatient and crash a lot or they're too patient and just don't quite win enough races. And so it's that ability to adapt, I think, is really important. And, and you know, for myself, early in my career, one of the areas, I, I'm a very introverted person. And with the media and sponsors and working with a big team and stuff like that, I felt it was uncomfortable for me to kind of put myself out there. And I had to learn how to program my mind and change my, my ability to behave in different ways. And, you know, I would do mental imagery or visualization of me in different situations and pretend that I have like a, a, like a, a dial on my chest that I could dial up the outgoing personality now. And I, you know, walk into a room where I needed to represent or talk to sponsors and it'd be like, turn that up, here I go. And I'd be that person for that point or for that period of time. And to this day now, you know, sometimes I'll be doing a presentation or a workshop or seminar and I'll ask the group, like, what do you think? Am I an introvert or an extrovert? And everybody says, oh, you're an extrovert. And I go, great. Then I've proven that we can adapt our behaviors. And I think one of the things that racing does is you either learn to adapt very quickly or you don't, you're not going to be as successful as you need be. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, hey, as, as human beings, we learn through life experiences to adapt to different situations. But some people are more open and willing and more deliberate about how they're going to adapt. And, you know, maybe that's what Warren Buffett is talking about in, in terms of, you know, you have to, sometimes you need to be, sometimes you need to dive down, dive in there and go for it. And other times you need to back off and think and be more logical. And how, how did you train yourself to be more adaptable? Did you take sort of acting skills or that, that, that sort of thing? Um, that's quite interesting. So, yeah. So, so, you know, I learned early on the value of mental imagery or visualization. You know, every athlete in the world, successful athlete in the world uses visualization a lot of them use it strictly for the technique of their sport. And, you know, people in business, people in music or arts, people all, all I, I believe every person in the world visualizes. If they have worried about something, they have visualized something, right? And in that case, something going wrong. So, but I did, the, I learned how to use visualization as a very deliberate practice tool. So every evening uh, for months, I would take 20 minutes, close my eyes, relax, and see myself in different situations. In the car, it was, you know, I could dial up the aggressive, go for it, no patience kind of thing. Or maybe it was early on in the race and I'd dial that down. Then I'd get out of the car and I'd see myself in a situation working with a group of people in my team. And it was my job to kind of motivate, inspire that group of people and bring them together. And, you know, that meant spending time with them and then as a group. And I'd see myself kind of dialing that part of my personality up. And then there'd be a situation, you know, I'd see myself, um, you know, doing a sponsor presentation or doing a TV interview. And I'd turn that part of my personality up. And I would just visualize this over and over and over again. And the most important part of that was, uh, what I believe is, uh, is part of that process is building in triggers. And, you know, for example, it might be, um, you know, in the car, I might have a trigger of just, I say the word patience. And that triggers that mental program that I've programmed through mental imagery and visualization. Um, it triggers that. Or it might be, you know, it might be just, it, it's like outgoing. And I walk into a room and it's like, okay, I'm going to be outgoing and go and meet people and everything. You know, at the end of, at the end of that evening, I'll go away and I'm going to be ah, worn out from doing that. But I was able to adapt in that moment by uh, triggering these deliberate programs that I had visualized uh, beforehand, pre-planned beforehand. And, and I would say that that is probably the single biggest thing, 
the thing that had the biggest impact on my racing career of anything, I only wish that I'd learned it when I was 15 rather than when I was 30. But I really, I, I worked with somebody that kind of introduced the concept and then I, I took it further. And now it's something that I train, I coach other drivers with is that ability to adapt their behavior to the situation. And it's, it's a matter of identify what the situation is, what's the ideal behavior in that moment in time, and then have a pre-programmed plan in your mind for that. And you just trigger it and you go, you know, outgoing or logical or analytical or go for it or whatever. And you just, and you trigger these programs in your mind. Jake, uh, you've been very efficient in your response there, Ross, and you've also covered the next question, <laughs> um, which was drivers and teams, uh, what do they do to foster the right uh, temperament? So it sounds like you have quite a rigorous approach there. Um, and you've, you've talked about visualization, but also almost an auditory, mentally an auditory uh, or a verbal sort of cue to shift your temperament, if you like, or adopt a, a frame of mind, uh, perhaps that, that suits the circumstances. Yeah, and it's interesting you asked the question, what, what do teams do? And my first response or reaction to that is some do a lot, some do nothing. And no surprise, the, the teams that do little in that area are not as successful as the teams that take a deliberate approach to addressing that. And, you know, I could give all sorts of examples of a, of a race team that has the technical skills and ability to be winning a lot, and yet they just never quite clicked. And, you know, we see this in sport all the time, right? You see a team and they've got the most skilled players on their team, and yet they just don't quite click. Yeah. And well, that reminds me of the Football World Cup where Brazil was totally smashed by Germany. You know, everyone knows the Brazilian players were supposed to be amazing, but they fell apart. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's not recognizing that part of it. And, and, you know, it's kind of, in a way, it's surprising, it's shocking that there are teams that, I mean, in Formula One, you know, they're spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and there are teams that haven't quite addressed that part of it, that building the right culture, building the right um, atmosphere uh, to bring out the best in people and as, as, as individuals and as a group. And so would you do like a, would you somehow have sort of a, an exercise where you all share the same visualization or you all have the same uh, cues about the frame of mind you want to put yourself in? How, how might a team specifically uh work together using what you're talking about so the teams that i've worked with what we've done is first of all getting people to buy into the power of programming mental imagery visualization and in a very deliberate way because some people are you know some people are just oh boy that's that kind of woo woo kind of crazy mental kind of stuff i don't want to get into that and other people are very accepting of it. And so, you know, there's a little bit of a buy-in period. And, but once they kind of see some success. We don't care. We just want a high compounding rate and high returns. <laughs> exactly. You know, you see the results and all of a sudden you go, oh, okay, I'm going to do more of this, right? <laughs> so it, that's the first step is just getting everybody to buy into it. One of the things that has been really powerful with the teams that I've worked with is, and it seems so simple that, you know, we get a group of team together, a group of the, the individuals together, and we go through each of their roles and we go, okay, what is a team manager? What, what, everybody, just give us words, phrases that describes your vision of the perfect team manager. And people are saying, you know, decisive, uh, you know, good with communication, uh, you know, spends time with individuals, all these different things. And, you know, the team manager is going, oh, okay, I got to remember that. And then we do, okay, what about the lead mechanic? Or what about the data acquisition guy? Or what about the, you know, the designer? I mean, and, and you kind of go through that. And the whole team plays a role in helping each individual get a clear mental image of what is the perfect 
what does the perfect person do in that role? And it's the team has helped that individual get that clear vision of what they how they're supposed to perform. You kind of give each one of them sort of the opportunity to then go away and uh, spend time, you know, practicing that part of it. And then, you know, hopefully then you can start to build in little triggers and the trigger could be, uh, you know, a trigger that, that I, I use personally and I've used with teams is uh, it's watch this. And it's kind of like, you know, if you're the underdog, you sort of come into a situation and, and everyone's going, watch this. And everybody's kind of got that attitude of, I'm going to show people here, like we're not expected to win, but watch this. We're going to up our game. We're going to, yeah. And, and it, so you start to use these triggers and the fun part is then each other, you know, somebody's just, you know, they, they're, they're having a bad day. You, you know, somebody else comes up and kind of nudges them and says, watch this, let's go. And now the team has a, uh, a, a group tool to use to help bring everybody up. And again, super powerful. It's, it's amazing. It seems so simple and yet, uh, you know, it's, it's in the end, it's all about getting the best behavior out of people. Mm. It, it really does refer to temperament. Watch this sounds like you're squatting down and you're focusing and you're preparing to be competitive. Yeah. And, and you, you mentioned focus, uh, what, one of the things that is, I'd say, very challenging for competitive people, and I think, you know, anybody in sport is competitive, anybody that's serious about investing, they're competitive. Um, and so then it becomes, how do, you, how do you manage that competitive spirit? And I can tell you that throughout my life, I have been an extremely competitive person. That's kind of my nature. And I've had to learn how to manage that where instead of being so focused on the results, I had to kind of change my views and get more focused on what is the process, what is my performance needed? What is it needed to get the result that I want? Because if all you're doing is focusing on just the result, often you try too hard, you, you you, you don't get, you're not spending enough focus and attention on the process. And that is a very difficult thing for competitive people, I think, is keeping the end goal in mind, the result, but not getting hyper-focused on it to the point where you forget the process and the performance to get there. Phil mentioned that point as well. Um, yeah. Uh, to, to reward the fact that you've engaged in the process, which you know, I guess, applied enough times or consistently enough will lead to a good outcome um but yeah not not getting too bound up about the actual outcome each time yeah yeah it's 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 difficult for competitive people and but i would say and everybody's a little different you know we have different levels one of the main things i learned as the coach is there are no two drivers in the world who are alike and there are no two people in the world who are alike you know that are exactly the same so you're constantly having to adapt. Uh, and some, some drivers, some people, you know, I've worked with, I've done coaching, like executive coaching and things like that as well. And, you know, what works for one CEO doesn't necessarily work for another. So it's, it's learning to adapt to that, but, uh, you know, learning to recognize when you're too focused on that result and not mm -hmm. enough on the process or the performance to get there. Okay, so the message I'm getting so far are adaptability, mental imagery, and triggers, and paying attention to the cohesiveness of a team and how that can add to your, uh, add a competitive edge in your driving. I'm going to jump to the topic of biases. And in investing, in making decisions, people can be biased in their approach. For example, they could follow... Uh, another in investor's methodology without actually doing their own research themselves. And there's a lot of different types of biases. So authority bias is the one that I just gave an example of, but there's um, other types of biases. So, but what about in 
managing biases for drivers. So do they have any, um, have, do you have any examples of where that's occurred? Hey, yes, uh, I, I would say the biggest thing there, you know, from a driving, from a driver perspective is there are certain drivers who, you know, maybe they were taught a, a specific technique early in their career and they get kind of stuck in that way. And sometimes as a coach, part of my job is to change that approach, that strategy or that technique. And, you know, I think that's a, you know, it's, it's it, in some ways you can think about it, it's a habit, right? It's a habit of, well, I've always done it this way, so I'm gonna to continue to do it that way. And, you know, the, the, the research, um, I'm, I'm sure you're probably aware of that, that the research around mindset, uh, Dr. Carol Dweck, professor of uh, psychology at Stanford University, she wrote a book called Mindset and identified that there are kind of two different types of people. There are people with a fixed mindset, which are, this is the way I am, you know, the success that I have is because of the way I am. And people who have a growth mindset, which is I'm constantly evolving and adapting. And no big surprise, the people that have more of a growth mindset tend to be more successful more often than those who have a fixed mindset. And I was fortunate enough that uh, after reading her book, I actually reached out to her and just said, wow, this had a major impact on the way I think about life and driving and sport and business and parenting and everything. And she offered to uh, do a little, re a small study of drivers. So I got a group of, I can't remember what it was, 150 or so drivers and go through this survey thing. And we found that no surprise, the drivers who tend to be more successful had more of a growth mindset. And those who were not as, as successful had more of a fixed mindset. So I think, you know, whether it's the bias of that's just the way I am, I'd say that's kind of a fixed mindset. Uh, or there are people I think can, you know, maybe you can flip that around the other way and say, you know, I have a bias towards people who have a growth mindset. Um, and I have a growth mindset and it's all about learning and adapting and getting better. So I guess a bias could be bad and maybe it can be good as well. That's, I guess that's how I would look at it. I'm, I'm just also, I just want to tie that back to what we were talking about before. So that's a good book that people can look at, the mindset book, but with the visualization and mental imagery, do you have any recommendations in whether it's books or videos that use, or even a book that you've written yourself on, on those topics, or is it just something you practice with people? There's a lot of uh, books and, you know, online resources in the, kind of in the sports psychology world and around the use of visualization, mental imagery. You know, to me, a lot of it, it's programming. You know, I, I always say, we do what we do because we're programmed to do so. And we don't do what we want sometimes because we don't have the right programming yet. Or every now and then we just access the wrong program in our brain. So that's kind of, the, to me, it's all about our programming. So there, there are a lot of books in the, I'd, I'd say in the sports psychology world in that area. You know, I wrote with a, with a co-author, I wrote a, a book called um, Inner Speed Secrets. I have an ebook online that's a mental imagery guide for drivers, but it doesn't matter whether it's for drivers or tennis players or investors or whatever, right? Um, it's parents, right? It's, it's all about how do I use mental imagery in a very deliberate way? And, you know, it's not difficult. The great, and the great thing is it costs absolutely zero. Um, so, I, I would say if somebody's listening to this and they're like, well, I want to learn more about that. Uh, th there are so many sports psychology books out there that are, that cover the whole, you know, mental game. Uh, there is not a, if you, if you just go onto Amazon and search mental game books, you will find dozens of books and a big part of every single one of those ones is around the use of visualization. Or you can go to my speedseekers.com website and download my little uh, ebook on it. And uh, you can read that in a very short period of time and just jump in and do it. Okay, great. Um, that's probably a good uh, point to try to summarize where we've gotten to so far and check if we've missed anything before we begin to try to apply things in this episode. 
Um, so what big things have we missed so far that racing drivers and teams do to manage emotions, urges and biases and foster the right temperament to drive quickly and safely? You know, one of the things about motorsport, about, about racing, auto racing, is uh, it's very difficult to make a mistake and then go back and fix it. You know, you're, you're driving around a track. If you turn the steering wheel too late, you're going to miss the right line to the corner. It's not that you can put it in reverse back up and go say, I'm going to go do it again. So one of the things I think uh, race drivers learn very quickly is let it go. I'll get it next time. And I think that's a very valuable uh, approach to, to thinking about things. Now, there, you know, you could go too far with that. Uh, you know, I mean, obviously, if I make a poor investment decision and I have the ability to go back and change that, that's a different, that's a different opportunity. To me, you know, we kind of have two, uh, two different types of decisions we make in our life. Though, you know, those decisions that we have a lot of time to think about and we can analyze and dig into the, all the logical reasons why we should make this decision over another one. And then there are the, the decisions that we need to make just like that. And race drivers have to make a lot of those kind of decisions. And so, you know, I know some race drivers that in a, in a, in a race car, they never make a bad mistake, a bad decision. They're just like clicking them off like that. Ask them, you know, where do you want to go for dinner tonight? they freeze you know they cannot make a decision because they have too much time to think and uh, you know i think that finding that right balance between being analytical and kind of just trusting your your gut and saying i'm going to go for it and make this work i think you know one of my one of my biases i guess you know, or, or uh, beliefs about decisions is make a decision and then do everything you possibly can to make that the right decision rather than kind of like make the decision and then kind of sit back and go, well, now I'm going to see what's going to happen. No, do everything you can to then make that decision the right one. And sometimes if you have the opportunity, it could be going back and changing things, but at least you know that you've given it everything you've gotten along the way. So I don't know if I really answer, <laughs> answered your question, but I think there's a balance between being analytical in our thinking and kind of trusting the gut and just going with it and the best race drivers I know balance that and can switch back and forth I know some drivers who are so analytical that they get bogged down in the details and they're always just a little bit slow and then other drivers who never think they just do and they tend to make a lot of mistakes and they crash a lot and the best drivers have this ability to kind of flip back and forth between i'm going to be analytical up to this point now i'm just going to trust myself now i'm going to trust myself oh now i can go back and be a little analytical and i think finding that right balance along the way i mean hey maybe that's that a, sounds like temperament right there yeah 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 oh, I, I appreciate the philosophy that we're getting into <laughs> yeah yeah, I mean, the, the, the thing about racing is things happen so quickly, you learn how to adapt and change and do these things very quickly and deal with mistakes and then move on. Um, you know, I, I've come to, uh, I, I don't think of them as mistakes anymore. To me, they're learning takes, you know, they're just something to happen, I'm going to learn from it, and I'm going to move on. And rather than kind of getting bogged down and beating myself up if I, I made a mistake, oh no, you know, kind of thing. That totally relates to investing. I've still got a trade that I haven't managed to uh, swallow my ego enough to get out of yet. So. Wow. You know, the good thing is, is that race drivers have no egos. And I'm sarcastic there because... I, you know, I, I think managing ego is is a massive part of success, isn't it? It's oh, yeah. knowing when to. Uh, hey, if we have no ego, I think that's a bad thing. We're never going to be pushing. We're never going to be 
looking for the best. We're never going to be kind of trying to be our best. Uh, but if that ego starts to get in the way of making, you know, of, of again, being open, uh, having that growth mindset, being adaptable. Mm. Well, um, what you said reminds me of a, a bit of a local hero in the investing world in Australia called Andrew Page. And he started a paper trading platform called strawman.com. And he said exactly the same thing as you. Don't hold on to trades that have gone bad. There are thousands of businesses on the stock market. And just like another lap happens every minute or so on the racetrack, another stock will come along that, you know, is justifiable to get into. Pull your money out, put it on that one and get on with life. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to use, I'm going to borrow that one. <laughs> yeah. Ah, cool. I, I, I like all the overlaps here so far between the challenge that we, we both uh, are in. You, you far more um, than us. <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I, I don't know which is more challenging the, you know, investing or dri the, the, or driving around in a squiggly circle around a racetrack. Um, the one thing that, uh, you know, it maybe is great about both um, but maybe in some cases, one thing in racing is we get feedback immediately, you know, whether it's a track that we get around it in a minute and 35 seconds, a minute and 35.1 seconds later, you know, I did the right stuff or not. Sometimes I think with an investment, you can get pretty immediate feedback. Other times it could be years, right? And that's the challenge I think is, you know, I see friends who I have friends who, you know, in different you know, whether they're in, you know, land developers or something like that, or, you know, they're in a business where they're, they're in a project and that project won't come to fruition in for four years. And, and I'm kind of like, yeah. wow, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't have the patience to last more than a minute and 35 seconds. So uh, <laughs> I think, I think uh, that's a, uh, but, but, but again, investors that do do this, uh, it, they're more traders, I would have thought. Um, but that it, you, there's definitely, well, the, the best example would be Renaissance Technologies um, and they have a science-driven approach and they'll, they don't give a damn what it is. They basically use big data and big machines and yeah, um, dollar investing and holding for 10 years um, doesn't matter to them. And they've done 35% compounding rate, I think, after fees for the past 30 or 30 years or so. So blowing everyone out of the water. Um, yeah. So if you want frequent feedback, you can get it. Uh, just depends on yeah the approach. If you or a racing team you are on set up an investment analyst team to run a long-term holding, compounding portfolio using your principles of managing a team of fast and safe drivers, what would that team do? How would they handle mistakes and communication about those mistakes amongst each other? What parts of driver behavior would be mapped directly onto decision-making about what to buy and how to hold on to it? Let's see how much of that you can uh, bite off and... <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big, big question. And, uh, you know, I think you touched, you know, as, I'm, as you're going through, I'm kind of like, oh, communication is really important. And, but I think, you know, probably in the very beginning, it's, it's a common, clear vision of what the goal is and not just what the goal is, but how do we get there? Um, and then how are we going to kind of measure that along the way? And maybe that's, you know, related to the kind of big data approach to, to investing. And, you know, one of the things, uh, a, a coaching technique that I learned years ago, um, I, I was working with a, a driver and the driver could not quite do what I was asking the driver to do. And uh, because I was, you know, I had learned, I trained, I'd studied all around the sports psychology and the, and the power of visualization or mental imagery, I thought, okay, I need to take this driver, sit him down in the trailer and have him close his eyes and visualize doing that technique. And I had him do it for a while, go back on the track, made the same mistake again. And I brought him back in and we did more visualization, more programming, and he made the same mistake again. And I was like, I was getting frustrated. Like, what am I missing here? Like, this should be working. And 
what I ended up doing was because we had two-way radio, I could talk to him while he was driving. Uh, I asked him, as he was coming out of the corner, I, I asked him, how close are you basically to what I was asking him to do and what and to visualize? And, you know, he said, I was like, you know, three meters away and then two meters away and then one meter. And all of a sudden it clicked for him. And that day I kind of came up with this concept that I call the learning formula. And it's MI plus A equals G. MI stands for mental image, having this clear mental image of what we're trying to achieve, but not only the goal, but how, like, what's the process? What's the performance? What's the, the, how are we going to get there? So having a clear mental image of that and then an awareness, that's the A part of the, this equation. If you have the awareness of, of that, then you will reach your goal. And that's the G part of it, MI, MI plus A equals G. And mm. it's like, if, if, if I have a really clear mental image of what it is I want and how I'm gonna get there, and I have an awareness right now of how I'm doing in relationship to that, my brain does this magic and says, okay, body, brain, do whatever it takes to bring these two together. Mm -hmm. So uh, I've used that as a concept, as a coaching strategy in everything that I've done. And I've found that, you know, so I, I maybe, you know, to simplify your question, if it was like, okay, we're going to bring this team of people together, I'd go, okay, we all need to have a very, very clear mental image of what it is that we want and how we're going to get there. And in some ways, that a, it, you know, for a business, that's the strategic plan, right? And yeah. then there, we also need to have awareness along the way. We need to have little, and in case of the business, it's the metrics, you know, whether they're daily, weekly, monthly, quarterly, yearly, you know, they're the metrics that are kind of saying, how close are you to the mental image that we want? And when a business has those two things together, I think the business operates better. Same thing with a race team, same thing with a driver. I think if we have that mental image plus the awareness, we're going to reach our goal that we've set. Mm. And that has been a, 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 an amazingly uh, helpful tool for me to look at many situations and go, what's missing? Is it a clear mental image of how we're going to get there? Is it an awareness of how we're doing in relationship to that? Mm. And since this is about behavior, you know, I use this example all the time. You, you know, those when you're driving down the highway and they have one of those speed readout boards that tells people how fast they're going. What do people do when they see those signs? Oh, well, young kid paid up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, some people kind of go, well, how big a number can I get on there? But, we're, we're <laughs> but, but so yeah. most people, they go, oh, and they look at the speedometer, go, how fast am I going? And then they slow down. It changes people's behavior yes. without an awareness it, of what you're doing. You're not going to change mm -hmm. your behavior. And so I, I always look at what's missing here, clear mental image or an awareness of where we are right now. And if we have those two things together, uh, that's when the magic happens. So to answer your question, I'd say make sure that we have mental image plus MI plus A equals G will get us our goal. Excellent. I love the simple formula. Yeah, so do I. It's really nice. I'm kind of simple that way, so. <laughs> um, the next question is, from your years of racing and instructing experience, could you comment briefly on any emerging trends? And the reason we ask this is because if we can understand an industry a little bit better, then we may be able to identify opportunities for investment, whether it's the industry itself or the supply chain is there anything new that's happening in racing or the, even the promotion of racing as well well uh, motorsport is all about emerging emerging trends and new innovations and things like that i mean that's that's what the sport is based on so there's a lot of new things i mean uh obviously the electric car uh you know with uh electric car racing formula e is a you know is a, a certainly an emerging part of it from a overall sport part of it where you know a lot of car companies that have been involved in some aspects of the sport are now dropping out of that to go and financially invest in and commit to the electric car racing because 
we kind of all know that that's where the the automotive industry is going is electric vehicles. So I'd say that's part of it. I'd say the other part of it is, as you were asking, I was thinking in terms of bringing out the best in humans, you know, the simple answer is technology because that's the answer to everything now, right? But I think the technology, motorsport has used data for many years and they have systems on the cars that, <clears throat> you know, can measure the, you know, how much the vehicle is moving up and down to thousands of a millimeter, right? <clears throat> and and yet I think the, the difference that's happening with some of the technology now is most of that technology told you what the car and the driver did. And now a lot of the technology is starting to tell us what is the driver doing? And, you know, as a simple example of that, when a driver that I'm coaching goes on the track, they drive, at the end of that time on the track, I can look at data and I see a squiggly line that represents the brake pedal pressure. So I can see when the driver braked, how hard the driver braked, how smoothly they released the brake, and I can see the shape of that graph and everything, and it's a, and it's a squiggly line. But it's telling me what the driver did. And it also doesn't tell me why is a driver braking like that? And I think there are there are some tools that that are being developed, and that I'm kind of I'm working with some different organizations with. In that that is, you know, for example, uh, I know of basketball players who will wear a sleeve in practice, and that sleeve measures the movement of their arm. And you know, if we start to adapt that to a driver, a driver may have that on their foot and ankle and calf. And now I can see. How are they actually moving their foot that now represents how they're braking? So I think there is that part of it. What what company is developing that technology in those sleeves? Or maybe you can't <sighs> say, but I don't know. Uh, I, I, I can't say only because I can't remember the name of the company off the top of my head that's been doing that. And, uh, yeah. you know. Maybe it's like thinking... a Garmin, Garmin or, or something like that. Well, funny you should mention it. I, I've been working with Garmin for the past three years, and they've just launched a product in motorsport that is that provides verbal feedback to the driver while the driver is driving and learns from what the driver is doing and says, you know, you just did that better than you ever had before, or now this time break later. And so I've helped them develop that product. Uh, it's called the Catalyst, and it's a very cool little device that you put in your car. And it gives you feedback as you're going along. So it's, you know, everything, what, everybody you, talks about AI, you're right? You're the trend, Ross. You're, you're the trend. We need to be watching you. <laughs> well, you know, I don't, I don't want to get left behind. Uh, and again, you know, it's, it's part of that growth mindset thing, right? If, if we think well, that's it, you know, everything's been invented. Well, no, we're just going to get left behind. So uh, I've noticed that Garmin, they basically almost take hold, they're like the tech version of Nike. Nike um, is famous uh, for, at least in my mind, for going 500X in value from 1985 to 2015. And basically what Nike did was take by the neck different sports uh, using their shoes. And it seems like Garmin's now, like they do it for aircrafts, they do it for even sailing. I think they have a sailing watch Obviously, there's the running. How, to what extent do you do, you, do they dominate uh, race driving? Uh, until uh, September 1st, they were hardly involved. I mean, the only involvement they had in motorsport up until September this year was they have a watch called the driver. And, you know, you can wear it while you're driving the track and it takes your lap times and keeps track of that and tells you how consistent you are and things like that. But this new device called the Catalyst is kind of their first real we're in motorsport and it's it's interesting the the comparison between them and nike like in some ways they're they're both leaders the difference is you know nike is very heavily marketing oriented and directed garmin is a more conservative company and they kind of let their products do more of the talking and it, it's but it's they're they're a fantastic company and when i was i three years ago, I got contacted by this fellow and he says, I'm 
I work in Area 51 at Garmin. I'm kind of like, how cool a name is that? Like that's their skunk works department kind of thing. And, you know, they're constantly looking at developing new products. And the, so I, I, in, you know, motorsport from a technology perspective, typically the companies have been smaller companies um, and they're very motorsport specific, smaller companies. And I'd say this is one of the first times that I can think of where a company like Garmin has come in into the sport and said, we're going to develop a product for this sport. So it's, it's very cool to see and fun, fun having been a part of the development of it. Oh, I'm glad we asked that question. That's yeah. yeah. I'd like to keep, keep my eye on that. And I'll, yeah, I've, I've heard good things about Garmin. Um, there's, yeah, they've been on a consistent uptrend over the past few years as, as a, uh, from an investor's perspective. Right. Okay, um, this relates, uh, it, it's on the theme of um, you, you being a, a co-author of Performance Pilot. Um, excuse me for, for asking this, but I had to. So Mark Weber once flew his car, I think it was a Merc in the 90s. Uh, have you ever flown a car, Ross? If not, what's the hairiest thing that ever happened to you on the track? And maybe have... you can describe what happened to Mark Weber. Um, yeah, so uh, I fortunately I have not been I've not been upside down, or like I've gotten a little bit of air, but not a, not as not the kind of air that Mark Weber Mark Weber uh, tangle with another car and with open wheel cars, you know you get the front tire clipping the rear tire of another one and it just flips the car up in the air, and that starts it. And then Mark Weber was also in the Mercedes at at Le Mans, where. You know, you think about this car coming over the crest of a hill and it gets air underneath it. And now there's like this big flat, think of it as a, you know, a big piece of plywood and it got air underneath it that's going, you know, in that case, probably 200 miles an hour. And the thing just takes off and starts to fly like a, you know, paper airplane and flips up and, and flies around. So fortunately, I have not had that experience. Uh, uh, I, I'm always reminded by, you know, when, the right visualizations, Ross. <laughs> yeah. The, the, uh, you know, Paul Newman, the actor who, who raced cars for years, uh, you know, he, he was quoted at one time as saying, uh, Newman's law is there's no point in applying the brakes when the car is upside down. And so I always wondered how hard Mark Weber was pushing on the brake pedal when the car was flying through the air. Cause I think that's probably hu human instinct to do that. So, um, for, for me, the, you know, I, I've had a relatively safe career, but uh, when I was the day before qualifying for the Indy 500 during a practice session, my car actually caught fire while I was on track at 225 miles an hour between turns three and four of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. And by the time I got the car stopped and bailed out, uh, I'd had like second, third degree burns on my face and neck and hands and spent qualifying weekend and intensive care instead of uh, on the track qualifying so that was kind of my um unpleasant experience uh, the worst the, my work hairiest uh, experience that i've had in in uh, in racing um you know wow, Ross. Years, you crash a bit but uh, it's you know nothing nothing hurt too bad so mm. yeah. well that reminds me of um another question i was going to ask you about which was uh when nicky lauda was trapped in a his burning f1 car and he was straining so much apparently at his harness that other drivers who stopped couldn't get him out um how you must have been all sorts of things things must have been going through your mind can can you tell us a little bit more so you know, an Indy car stops extremely quickly, right? Uh, with all the aerodynamics and the brakes and slick tires and everything. But when you're doing 225 miles an hour, it still takes a while to stop. And from the video afterwards, uh, it, it, from the time that it was apparent that I, the car caught fire and was basically spraying fuel into the cockpit on top of me on fire, uh, to the time that I got the car stopped, got out of the car and people got to me and got the fire put out as I'm rolling around on the ground was 43 seconds. And, you know, fortunately we're wearing fire, fire retardant uh, suit and everything. But during that period of time, I can tell you the worst part of it is, I mean, at first you just go, 
what is going on? Like you can't believe it. And then all of a sudden you're going, this hurts really badly. And how can it hurt that bad so quickly? And then, then you go, because all the oxygen is gone, you're like, I can't breathe. And to this day, to me, I, I imagine it's, it's, it would be like drowning because you're kind of like, you're just going, you cannot get any air. And, uh, but the motivation to get stopped and get out of the car is extremely high. In my case, I had my safety harness belts off. Um, you know, an Indy car, generally, you, the only way you can get out of the car, you actually take the steering wheel off. There's a clip system that you can take the steering wheel off so you can get squeeze it back out of the car. I managed to get out of the car without taking the steering wheel off. And that's just pure motivation. Like, I got to get out of this thing. And I stopped when the car was still rolling a couple, you know, a few miles an hour and just started rolling around on the ground. And, um, you know, it's survival instinct. You just, uh, man, this hurts. I cannot breathe. I got to get out of this place. And, uh, you know, fortunately, Indianapolis Motor Speedway has, you know, during especially, you know, it was the month of May when they, you know, leading up to the Indy 500, they have some of the best safety people in the world, the safe, best doctors. And, you know, you spend a few days in hospital and, you know, you get treated pretty well and all that kind of stuff. So, you know, I recovered 100%. I have no feeling in my fingertips from getting burned so bad. But other than that, uh, you know, it was, uh, I guess, three, well, actually a week later, I got back in the car and tried to qualify, despite barely not even really being able to hold on to the steering wheel, but couldn't quite qualify. But uh, you, you uh, were just like me, car, racing, racing two weeks later, I guess I was racing another race. So, so. Gee, because Lauda, I, I remember watching this Netflix documentary and Nicky Lauda basically was shown getting back in the car with his, his face still burnt. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I've been there where you're putting the Bella Calava, the head sock and helmet on and it's like it's it's painful because you've got blisters all over your face. But, you know, when you want to do something, well, in my case, I wanted to do something since I was five years old. Um, yeah, a few little burns aren't going to stop you. And in Nicky Lauda's case, it was I got to win a world championship. So, so. I'm I'm humbled and inspired thank you ross for for coming on the on the show my pleasure this has been this has been fun because it's it's fun to think about the similarities the differences um and how much we learn from doing different things that apply elsewhere um, yeah uh for more i uh, i'm sure everyone wants to find out more about you um, could you tell us uh, where we can find you online, uh, where we can buy all of your books? As far as I can see, you've written, you've been a prolific author. Um, any other podcasts that you're on uh, and when your next webinar uh, or seminar is? So pretty much everything I do is speedsecrets.com, my, my website. You know, I have... Uh, you know, links to, I have a, I have a podcast that is on all the regular podcast platforms, you know, uh, and it's just Speed Secrets podcast. And I have different guests on there. Uh, and, you know, I've had guests, it's motorsport related, but I've had, uh, uh, you know, like a, a sleep researcher talk about the importance of sleep and what, how we learn, uh, you know, another author of another book that's around you know, who studied the mental traits of athletes in a different sport. So I'm constantly looking for different people that way, kind of like you guys, I guess. And, uh, but, you know, the, the podcast is about, is about driving. Uh, and yeah, so speedseekers.com. Uh, right now, I don't have a webinar scheduled because I'm just kind of trying to figure out my schedule and calendar with uh, uh, my main number one coaching client. Um, and trying to find it where it fits in, but probably mid January is probably going to be my next, uh, next webinar online. So, um, that's it. Speedsecrets.com and then all the usual social media stuff that I, that I have to do. So. <laughs> sure. We'll, we'll put it all, uh, in the show notes and yeah, people can all, uh, can follow you wherever they wish. Um, and hopefully everyone who listens will attend your next webinar when you advertise it. Mm -hmm.